This is the Ancient and Medieval History Lecture for Tuesday, 16th of March, 2021. And you should have your notes out. We are talking about the crisis of the third century. Now, what we've done up to the time of Maximinus Thraxus is to set up. <clears throat> Some people consider to the Severi and the Civil War before the Severi to be part of the Pax Romana. I do not, uh, for a long list of reasons, mainly that uh, it was a dissent. It was a dissent from the idea of senatorial government having some role. It was a dissent from the idea of an imperial republic. It was a dissent from the idea of peace and prosperity. It was a dissent from the idea that emperors are there to serve a greater good. And instead, what is replacing all of that Pax Romana stuff from the age of the adopted emperors is the absolute rule of Septimus Severus. The bizarre, well, the, the viciousness of, of Catacalla, the, the bizarreness of Heliogabalus, and the nice intentions, you're going to want to move that uh, so it doesn't jostle. Uh, the nice intentions of poor Alexander Severus, but the good intentions alone does not make a good emperor. So, the Germans are being stirred up by the arrival of Goths, which nobody really knows about in the Roman world yet, or they don't understand the significance of it. And as such, um, the Germans begin pressing the Roman frontier which is going to cause a likelihood of war. So I will darken in the Danube frontier so that you can see it from a distance. And I will also darken in the Rhine frontier. So, here's the basic border of Rome. It includes Dacia, and by this point, the border of Britain had been moved a bit north. So, because the Germans are jostling up against the Roman imperial borders, war is likely, in fact, war is expected. And Maximinus Thraxus, a former gladiator wrestler, man who's killed with his bare hands, Picked by Septimus Severus because of his size and his intimidation factor. <clears throat> but a man who rises through the army to become an army corps commander, a commander of many legions of the entire Rhine frontier, <clears throat> because of his, his intelligence, this is a formidable fellow, and he's looking forward to a good war. But then this pipsqueak young guy comes along with all the good intentions about peace, We've got to have peace. And this is not what Maximinus Thraxus wants to hear. He wants war because he thinks it will bring him glory. His troops want war, even though they'll, it'll put them at risk, <clears throat> because they think they'll get wealthier by stealing the tribes, uh, German tribes' wealth. And the emperor, Alexander Severus, comes calling uh, for peace. So... If you appreciate the vicious capabilities of human beings, it should not surprise you that when Maximinus invited his Caesar, his emperor, to join him in his tent to reveal something very important to the negotiations for peace, and then comes out a couple minutes later saying, oops, the emperor broke his neck, and his troops immediately hail him, Imperator! Maximinus Thraxus, Imperator, Maximinus Thraxus. Well, either they were waiting for it because the emperor and his men had laid, or the general and his men had laid the groundwork, or they just understood the way the world worked and were able to immediately, uh, immediately proclaim their general as emperor. Nobody contests it. Why? Well, because um, 
the cortege of Alexander Severus is in the power of Maximinus's army. And it would have been suicide to argue the point. So they proclaim him emperor too. This is the beginning of the 50 years of the intense crisis. Now, Maximinus marches on Rome. He wants to be proclaimed emperor by the Senate, and he wants to be in the city where he can be in charge of everything. However, why should the Rhine armies, which are smaller than the Danubian armies, which are smaller than the armies on the eastern frontier with Persia, why should the Rhine armies dictate who's going to be emperor? That's like the Praetorian Guard back before the, at the beginning of the last civil war. The Praetorian Guard declares who's going to be emperor. Oh, no, no, no. Each of the armies, the Rhine, the Danube, and the uh, Asian, are going to play a role. Well, same thing is true here. When Maximinus pulls his army, for the most part, away from Rome's border to go to Rome, that leaves the Rhine frontier exposed and the Germans do attack. So there is a war there, but it's not a very glorious one because the major forces of the empire are now leaving the borders. The Danubian armies, ultimately the armies on the eastern frontier with Persia, will all get involved in a series of ongoing civil wars. To the point where sometimes emperors reign for a year, maybe 18 months. That's not a long time. Some emperors have even less than a year. What this is from is the failure of Rome to develop a good succession law, a good imperial succession law. Remember, I talked about the problem of imperial succession, and I said that the Augustan solution, a monarchy with republican forms, would bite Rome in the posterior at some point. Well, that some point has arrived, because if the only thing you need to be emperor is an army, there are a bunch of armies. So Maximinus goes to Rome and gets killed there, fighting other emperor pretenders. And I'm not going to go into all the names. Just imagine a hairball, a giant bunch of wildcats attacking one another in the dust to the point where all you see from above is the dust and occasional claws and spurts of blood and tails and other things like that. That is what the Roman Empire becomes. A giant hairball. <laughs> with imperial armies engaged in primary combat, not with the Goths, not with the Germans, not with the Persians, but with each other. <sighs> this isn't good. And a little while after Maximinus, a guy named Decius comes along. He's emperor for a little while. And Decius believes that the problem with Rome is there's not enough of that old-time religion. And that old-time religion is Olympian paganism. Decius blames the Christians for all the bad things that are happening to Rome. Now, Decius is a good emperor, except from a Christian point of view. Because what Decius does is he tries restabilizing Rome's society, which has already been engaging in about a dozen years of civil war, by getting everyone to hate the Christians. You see, if the Christians had prayed to the pagan gods, <clears throat> they wouldn't have brought this doom to Rome. But the pagan gods are being ignored because of those damn Christians. So, get them! And there are empire-wide persecutions under the emperor Decius. But, of course, the Christians are not the primary cause. So the civil wars go on and Decius is overthrown. Now, sometimes the overthrow is not a foreign army, another Roman army coming in. Sometimes it's your own people. Sometimes it's your own number two that kills you because he wants to be number one. And this happens, too. 
in the four forty uh, th uh, two forties, late two thirties, early two forties. There's a Roman emperor named Philippus Arabus. Philippus Arabus is an Arab. And uh, that's not really a big deal because culturally he's Roman. He speaks Latin. He speaks Greek. He's a Roman army officer. But Philip the Arab is emperor at the thousandth anniversary of the founding of the city of Rome. Remember the AUC dating system? Ab Urbis Comita? From the founding of the city? Well, it's a thousand years after that. So the Emperor Philip is famous for holding the thousand year or the millennial games. And the millennial games are a series of gladiatorial events and chariot races and animal fights. And uh, there are exhibitions coming from all over the empire to show where Rome has come from a little... Waddle and Dow village on the hills overlooking the Tiber on the northern end of the plain of Latium to become the master of the world. And Philip the Arab desperately hopes that this thousand year anniversary is going to be so symbolically important that the Romans will stop fighting, accept his rule, and there'll be peace in the empire, which will allow the empire to fight foreign enemies that are beginning to invade Rome at will. And doesn't happen. The civil wars continue. In the 250s, the emperor Valerian takes over. Now, Valerian has some problems. First of all, uh, in the north, uh, Brit what's now Britain and France, they begin to break away under a Roman general named Posthumus. The east is also showing signs of independence. Hasn't fully erupted yet into a full split, but there are disloyal signs from around the empire. In other words, people are concluding that after now about 20 years of civil war, maybe Rome is just too much for one man to rule. Maybe Rome should be divided into a few nations, and each nation should have a general in charge, and the nation should hopefully work together against the body, the babblers, the barbarians. DC, uh, da, 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 Valerian is trying to field all of these problems, but then the Persians attack. And remember, the Neo-Persian Empire, the Sassanid Empire, is about five times as dangerous as the old Parthians were. They go into Roman territory pretty hardcore. Valerian brings an army east. He's going to win the Imperium and get the respect of people in the east anyway by beating the new Persian Empire. He marches into the desert to a city about halfway between Roman and Persian territory called Edessa where his army gets trounced, he is captured alive. He is the only Roman emperor to ever be captured alive by the enemy. I don't know whether he was knocked off his horse or whether he surrendered, but no other Roman emperor was ever captured alive. Valerian was. And at the end of class today, I'm gonna to show you a cliffside that exists in Persia that was carved at the behest of the great king of Persia, Persia, Shapur I. And it shows his victory over Valerian. And no Roman emperor should look like Valerian does. But after submitting himself, prostrating himself, Valerian is brought alive to the Persian capital. And there, he's in a cage. And anyone who wants to walk through the foyer on the way to the king's court and wants to throw a rock at him or hit him with a club or cut him a little bit with a dull sword is invited to do so. He dies slowly and in great agony. And then the Persians skin him, or they take his skin and they stuff it with straw. So there is a human statue in the foyer of the Persian palace 
of the Roman emperor stuffed like a wild animal after a hunt. Of course, it doesn't last long. It rots and is destroyed uh, in time. But this is not a good fate. Now, Valerian ends badly. But he has a son named Gallienus. And Gallienus reigns at the height of the trauma. The northwest of the Roman Empire, Britain and France, break away. Posthumus is an independent emperor. Gallienus can't do anything about it. In the east, after Valerian's defeat, the semi-Romanized, Hellenized city of Palmyra ends up rising up, driving the Persians out, and taking over the Roman East. Palmyra is first ruled by King Odonathus, but he dies of old age, and then his wife Zenobia becomes a ruling queen. Zenobia ends up ruling a third of the Roman Empire for a while. Queen Zenobia of Palmyra is uh, one of those rarities, an ancient uh, female ruler successful at war. And uh, she holds her empire against the Persians to their east and the Romans to their west for a good long time. So Gallienus, uh, the son of Valerian, is ruling the central third of the empire, basically Italy and the Balkans, Greece, Sicily, North Africa, Chironatia to uh, Carthage. This is the low point of the crisis. Because not only are there wars in the east involving the Persians, not only has the empire fractured in three, but the Goths show up. Now, at first, the Goths do things like cross the Rhine River, and they go all the way to Spain, and they raid Spain, and then they ride back home. How can they get all the way to Spain and back without having a serious defeat? Well, the Roman armies on the frontiers are weak, the Goths are strong, and the Roman roads are highways that speed their invasion. The Roman roads are not fortified. Anyone can go down them as far as they want. So the very highways built for Rome's security become used by Rome's enemies during these invasions. So that's bad. But it gets worse. A Gothic army invades Greece from the north, comes through Dacia. Dacia is lost to Rome, and takes command of a battle fleet that's in port. The Goths <clears throat> board the ships, and with this battle fleet, they go all over the eastern Mediterranean, sacking cities deep in the heart of the empire. Deep in the heart of the empire. And these cities are completely unprepared for a seaborne invasion by a bunch of super Germans, which is what the Goths are. The Goths are bigger than the Germans. They're more aggressive than the Germans. They're basically proto-Vikings. So the Goths spend about nine months on a cruise of the eastern Mediterranean, taking as much loot as they can, and they leave. And nobody is able to stop them. Then the Goths invade Greece for real. You're not going to go to a coast, a court of that coastal city and take some ships. They're going to sack the cities of Greece. So they go in. Now, at this point, Gallienus is killed by his commander of the guard, Claudius II, is how he names himself. Claudius II brings a Roman army to deal with the Goths, but not in the way you would expect. What you would expect and hope for if you're a Roman is for Claudius II's army to stop the Goths from attacking Greece. He doesn't do that. What Claudius II does is he hides out in the mountains north of Greece. What he's waiting for is the Goths to have their fill of rape and, and theft and arson and murder. 
And on their way home, they're going to be tired and hung over. They're going to be slowed down by all the treasure they have and all the slaves they have. They're not going to be in position to fight. It is this type of Gothic army that has already despoiled the cities of Greece that is hit in a mountain pass called Nisus, modern Serbian city of Nish, and Claudius II's army destroys the Goths. The Goths are not going to be a threat for another generation or two, 20 to 40 years. Claudius gets the name Gothicus, which means defeater of the Goths. Claudius II Gothicus's victory at Nisus is a key turning point in the crisis. But just as Claudius is ready to capitalize on that, he gets the plague and dies. He is succeeded by a general that worked closely with him named Aurelian. And Aurelian builds on the success of Claudius. Claudius has the only Roman army that has beaten the Goths. Now it's Aurelian's. Aurelian spends the next 10 years reunifying the empire. He marches west, defeats Posthumus, reincorporates Britain and Gaul and the Rhine frontier into Rome's empire. He then marches east and conquers Palmyra and captures Queen Zenobia. Zenobia is brought to Rome in chains. There is an old-style Roman triumph. Um, and Aurelian has rebuilt the empire. But he appreciates that Rome has changed, that the empire's borders are no longer as safe as they should be. So Aurelian orders the construction of massive walls around the city of Rome to protect the city of Rome in the event of attack. These Aurelian walls still stand in places. They are ruins that still exist in Rome. And they were very effective for a while at keeping the barbarians out. So that's Aurelian. But Aurelian dies. Probus takes over. There are famous statue, uh, uh, coins of Probus, which is sort of like a spearman, probic, Probus. And he's also very smart. Probity is a word that comes from the same root as a far-seeing person, Probus. Where you have Probus, and there's another figure beside him. And that other figure is Sol, Victor Invictus. Sol, Victor Invictus is the sun, ever conquering, never conquered. What Probus tries to do is get sun worship to unify Rome. Sun worship was never a big deal in Rome. It was a deal in Syria, but it was not a big deal in Rome. But Probus looks at the Christians as a threat, and he sees that the old Olympian gods are spent forces. They don't have any ability to inspire people and inspire their loyalty and to catch their imagination. So Probus tries to develop the religion of sun worship, sol weak dotin weakness, ever victorious, never defeated. But Probus is killed. Carinus takes over. And he goes east to fight the Persians again. And there's a moment where A Persian ambassador wants to be allowed to speak with the Roman emperor. This happens either with Carinus or Numerian. I'm honestly not sure which. But Carinus and Numerian basically were doing all they could to fight the Persians. And one of them, Carinus or Numerian, gives permission. When the Persian ambassador comes in his fine silk robes from a king that is treated like a living god, he looks around for the emperor, and all he sees are common soldiers eating bacon and beans, bacon and lentils. And one of the soldiers looks up and says in a very unpretentious way, so what do you want? What's your boss want with me? By this point, the Roman emperor is a soldier, nothing more, desperately trying to fight to keep his country unified. There isn't pomp, there isn't circumstance, there isn't glory. And the troops that the Romans are using do not 
any more resemble the troops of old Augustan or Pax Romana Rome. They are what is left after 50 years of crisis. When Numerian dies, a guy named Diocletian in 284 becomes emperor. And Diocletian is going to end the crisis. So, let's take a look at a couple of things. Would somebody shut the fan off, please? Turn off the lights and close the shades. Do you need to turn the video off? Uh, I'm going to see if it is visible or not. And I'm going to make it not so visible. So you on the video can listen, but you can look at the attachment I give. Okay. This is the giant bas relief in Persia that, rests, that shows. The Roman Emperor Diocletian in a suppliant position, supplicating position. And here is the great king of Persia, Shapur I, with his mural crown, his crown, and has these weird steps. And the crown has a balloon on it. Yep, a balloon that uh, is considered to be all the rage back in those days. This bas relief is an ultimate Roman uh, moment in Roman imperial history. The triumph of the East over the West. It doesn't last. But for Persia, it's a good moment, and it's a moment the Persians are still proud of. I guess I will shut off the video in just a moment, because I'm also going to show you something. Stop that is going to demonstrate the way the crisis works year by year. If there's a second video you at home, don't be surprised. There may or may not be. We'll see. <laughs> 